Welcome to the Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, how's it going out there, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle. Jamie Eads joining you as always. This is episode 44. Of course, this episode is going to air on Thanksgiving weekend, so I hope everybody had a very happy Thanksgiving on Thursday uh, here in the States. Hope everybody's getting in the holiday spirit because it is upon us, no doubt. We have a fantastic episode for you today. Uh, I am going to be joined by just one of the legendary names in drumming, and that is the name of Jeff Ockeltree. Uh, It's a great honor and privilege for me to be able to sit down with Jeff and talk to him for a little bit. So he'll be coming right up after this message from Los Cabos Drumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos Drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos Drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the US, Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center or heart of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned red hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of red hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, I am not going to take a whole lot of time on this intro. Uh, A simple Google search will be your friend here. But uh, again, an honor and a privilege for me to be able to have Jeff Ockeltree on this show. Jeff is just a legend uh, in the drum business. Uh, He has teched for... Many, many people, uh, names like Billy Cobham, John Bonham, Steve Smith. Uh, He's just worked with so many folks, uh, both live and in the studio. Just a legend uh, in drum building as well. So please help me welcome to the drum shuffle, the great Jeff Ockeltree. Good afternoon, Jeff. How are you doing today? Pretty darn God good. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Hey, Jeff, this is a real treat for me. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the drum shuffle. We really do appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, you know, it goes without saying. I mean, I think most drummers, uh, at least on the periphery, are aware of of who you are and, and what you did. And I don't want to overstate this. But you essentially created the job of the modern drum technician, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, well, and I, you know, I was just going to add to that that you know you've worked with some of the most legendary drummers in the business, but I want to go back and kind of start at the beginning. Um, I know you grew up in Iowa. How did you end up? in this career (laughs) well okay first of all where i grew up in iowa and i didn't live there all my life i only lived there for a few years what happened was we when i was born we moved to pasadena where the rest of my family was so we lived in pasadena for quite a while and then 
we moved back to Iowa from whence I came for a, a few years. And it, it was tough because those parents were about to get divorced. And, um, but you got to realize something. Davenport, Iowa just isn't Iowa. It's on the Mississippi River across from Illinois. It's where Bix Beiderbeck grew up. It's where Louis Belson grew up. It's a hotbed of music and history. It's got the 12th oldest symphony in the world. I mean, I mean, in the country, it, you got to realize it's not just another town in Iowa. It's a river town. And you have to remember the river traffic from New Orleans carried such great artists as Louis Armstrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Stopping in different cities along the way, St. Louis, et cetera. So it's, a, it's sort of like the tree of music. And Davenport, Iowa <clears throat> is a city that has a lot of different people that came from it's also where they invented chiropractics, Palmer College, John Deere, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's not just a, a, a river town. It's a very, it's, it's a, uh, interesting historical town for music and other types of things. Sure. So when I grew up, I was being taken, when I was living there as a child, for a while, I, I was being taken to the symphony by my grandparents, and I was around a lot of different kinds of culture and energy, and um, it was we were never bored. We were never looking for something to do. We were outside a lot. We were, my relatives were on the river, you know, and, and we just, we were very fortunate, very blessed to have grandparents. My grandfather was very educated. He went to Princeton College. He's, he's, he learned how to play the mandolin. He started the mandolin club. We were around a lot of different kinds of culture because that's what they, what they were all about. And, uh, they started building homes in the area. And, uh, it just, my brother and I were very lucky. Uh, and my sister were very lucky to have, um, such, uh, you know, a lot of motivation and a lot of, uh, uh, things around us that to, uh, to motivate us, to, to, to get us thinking. And, um, so the drums were always since the age of eight, just part of my life. Just, I mean, I'd hear the timpani and watch the different types of musicians in this very good symphony. Uh, it was very, very inspiring. And I knew someday I'd, I'd be a part of that somehow. Not necessarily at that level, the symphony, but, you know, somehow involved. Besides just being uh, one to play drums, but there's something else that, that uh, we were getting from being involved and in, uh, being taken to these different, you know, galleries to see art, to hear music. It just it was a very uh, for a young person, it was uh, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it it sounds uh, so, um, you know, and you brought up a good point about Davenport, you know, the, the musical tree of life. Uh, of course, you know, that's the Mississippi River that we're talking about. And, you know, I think that's right. So many forms of of great American music has really revolved around the Mississippi River. I mean, whether it be jazz in, it. in New Orleans or Delta Blues in Memphis, you know, it's just, it's really been around the Mississippi River. So that's a great point. It, it really is. And, and, and it's, it's, you're right. There's the blues aspect of everything and the, and the jazz. you got to remember, Chicago's not too far away from Davenport. Some of the best jazz musicians in the world came from there. Right. So it was, there's a lot of, a lot of energy going on in Chicago. Not just New York, not just St. Louis, but Chicago had some major stuff going on. And, uh, a lot of great players came from there. You know, a lot of great drummers that come from Iowa. I remember one day somebody told me, well, see, the drummer from America was from there. And, uh, they mentioned a few other people and I'm trying to remember who they are now, but we, we get caught up in geographical uh, uh, kind of smart aleck sayings. Like, oh, they grow a lot of corn there. That's about it. Well, first of all, Iowa does not have the most corn. There's another mis <laughs> misconception. I hear more people say dumbass things about Iowa. Um, you know, oh, you got a little farmer there. You're an idiot. Well, what I'm going to say is most of the corn comes in Nebraska and Illinois. Yeah. Not Iowa. So let's get off. I, I remember one of my favorite drummers 
uh, from Slaughter, Blas Elias. Oh yeah, he, I work with I work with him with the with the Blue Man Group. Okay, he's a he's a brilliant drummer. He's from originally from Texas, and he one day was talking to me about Des Moines, and I said, Des Moines, that's an amazing city. In fact, a really good drummer that I know, Paul Thompson, comes from there by the same name as the Paul Thompson who married John Bonham's sister, who was the drummer for Roxy Music, yeah. who owns that original John Bonham maple natural wood kit. Oh, wow. He was given that as a wedding present. But anyway, so so um, I heard Blas say something. We were in the dressing room before the next show at Blue Man. <laughs> he said something about Des Moines. I said, well, first of all, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the colleges in Iowa, especially in Des Moines. And so he said, what? And I said, yeah. And what do you think Des Moines is? That there's so much art coming from there. It's got one of the best newspapers in the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when I got done, he says, man, I am really sorry. I, I dissed <laughs> Des Moines, Iowa. <clears throat> I said, did you play there with Slaughter? Yeah. I said, did a lot of people come to the show? Yeah. I said, because they're cultured there. They like all kinds of music. <laughs> and so it's not like a lot of other cities where they don't even know what music is out there. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, it's not lost on me, Jeff. You know, I, I live in, you know, Georgetown, Kentucky, you know, just outside of Lexington. And, and most people, when I say, you know, I'm a professional musician and I live in central Kentucky, they're like, oh, bluegrass, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Bluegrass, and then and then the other thing that cracks me about, about what you're saying is when you first said Georgetown, I immediately think of Georgetown, Washington. Yeah, of course. DC. Yeah, you know, I that I love that city. Of course, we all know it for certain things like the basketball team. What do you call it, university? And also Watergate. And but but that's a nice. But when when I find out that there's a Georgetown, Kentucky, that's even more intriguing. Yeah, it's because I don't think just anybody moved to Georgetown, Kentucky, right? Well, I, I mean, yes, that's true. I mean, we're just kind of a little bedroom community of Lexington. And, you know, about 25, 30 years ago, Toyota built uh, the biggest plant in North America that they have in Georgetown. And so we've. Wow. Beco- yeah, we've become, you know, kind of a, a, a big little town if that makes any sense you know it's yes it does uh, it does you know so i mean we're the fastest growing county in the state of kentucky the county that i live in and it's really exploding like a lot of different places but i get what you're saying that the first thought people have when i say i live in georgetown kentucky and i'm a musician is they think of appalachian bluegrass music not rock. Yeah, where you're not, beating on a tub or, or a, right. you know, a barrel or something, and yeah, yeah, e- exactly. So, so I totally get that. Um, and then you got you got to remember you got those K- the Kentucky headhunters, and that guy played a drum kit that I, I saw it one day, and I don't even know how the bass drum stayed up. Um, <laughs> and he had a rasp, you know, he had a coonskin cap, and he was a nice enough guy when I talked to him, and. But I just, I like those guys. I thought they were good. And I love that drum set he had. But yeah, Fred I just thought that, it was funny. They really were Kentucky guys. Yeah, oh, they are. And and Fred yeah. put that drum set together out of old marching drums from his high school that he went to. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, he went to, right, well, that's... to a small high school in Kentucky, and he bought... All of their old, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s era marching drums and built that drum set out of those. That is so cool. Yeah. You know, that's, that takes some ingenuity and, and some thought. And uh, that's kind of artistic. That's, well, it is artistic. Yeah, I and, mean, and, and, he's and a, they did sound good. They did sound pretty damn good. Yeah, and and Fred's a, a a monster player. You know, he's a he's a John Bonham disciple, like so many of us. You know, he, yeah. he grew up yeah. listening to Bonham, and you know, wanted a you know a twenty six or twenty eight inch bass drum. That's that's one way of doing it. You know, um, yeah, yeah. So I. So growing up, all right, you know, I know you were a drummer, you were very involved with that, but how did you transition 
into and I know one of the first gigs that that everybody associates you with, of course, is the great Billy Cobham. Um, and, right. and you worked with him when he was playing with uh, Mahavishnu. And, you know, how did you end up? And you're well, really good, the guy that, that went from being a roadie to a drum technician. So well, that's a good way of putting it, because that's all we were. We were roadies. And and it was kind of insulting because a lot of people who had that job, they weren't in it for the right reasons. And the ones that were in it for the right reasons worked so hard. And a lot of them didn't really know there were other levels to that job. And so for me, I lived in Santa Cruz. I had a band. I was in a band with Howard Dumble, the great amplifier maker. Yeah. And we had a really cool band. And, and I had a really cool set of Rogers drums. And um, I, was, I was one day, my brother and I, we, we were set up somewhere to rehearse. And the place we were set up in was right next to us a sailboat shop and the it was also they had like a lounge in the place where we rehearsed and it was actually owned by a band that I ended up working with called Snail now that sounds funny in itself who the hell names their band <laughs> Snail these guys were unbelievable probably one of the best bands i've ever worked for and the, and the drummer's name, he was six foot eight, Ron Fillmore. He's still around. He's still a great player. He was the drummer. He had a double set of uh, orange sparkle. It looked like a ginger baker kit, Ludwig kit. But this band, the reason why I ended up with them was because one night we uh, set up a rehearsal and we called off the rehearsal. I left my drum set up and then some of the other band people went over there. And we're having a good old time partying, and they they left a cigarette burning in an ashtray by a gas heater. Oh! Hence, the building caught on fire. When my brother and I came back from dinner, we actually saw the fire trucks, the flames, and we ru- rushed up to the front door of that place and said, we need to get in there. And the fireman said, yeah, you guys probably started the fire. And we looked at the fireman and said, what did you say? He just figured we had long hair and we were just dumbasses. And we were going nuts because we could see into the building and the flames of the fire hadn't gotten near my drum kit. And he wouldn't let me go in there and get it. Uh, that's so awful. That, yeah. So those beautiful drums got charred. Some of them were really charred. Some of them were not so bad. It was a kind of sad experience. And, and it really, uh, it, it, it kind of stunted me. It just, I didn't, we didn't have insurance. We didn't have... So for a couple of days, we'd do these gigs with this other band, Snail, and I just I just said, can I help out? Gets my mind off this whole thing. And and uh, they passed the hat around and tried to get us some money because we had everything in there. My brother had all his clothes in there, his skis. He had his, a really nice saxophone. Just had a lot of stuff in there. And... Uh, now it's all, it was all gone, and now what do you do? So we just kind of immersed ourselves in working with this band, Snail. And I didn't even think about getting another set of drums. I just, I was so bummed out. I just, I just, I was just trying to think of ways to keep my mind off it. And um, it, one of the ways was to immerse myself and work with the drummer, Ron Fillmore, with this band, Snail. And I just knew that there are certain sensibilities that go with that job instead of just saying, Hey, Rody, you know, yeah. what, it, it was more than that. I was like, well, what about the integrity of all this? What about the, what about the next level of this? So that's how I, that's how I really got inspired to get off being depressed and losing my drums. And you know what? It was a really good thing to happen to me because I realized if I truly wanted to be a great drummer, like the ones I worked for, it was going to take a lot of work and I didn't have it. I didn't have the job. I didn't have the guts or the, the drive to do it at that moment. So I decided to take a different road to make me feel better and to, uh, learn a craft and teach myself some things that, that I knew would, would better the whole situation. And that's how I got started. And after doing that with them for a while, 
I had a really good friend named Arthur Rosado, who I guess moved back from back to Santa Cruz recently. He worked for Bill Graham, and he toured with all the big guys. I recently had a conversation with Carlos Santana. I said, do you remember Arthur? And he said, well, of course I do. Arthur worked with us for a while. And Bill Graham, of course, managed Santana for a long time, but we all know what happened to him. And so what happened, Arthur came to me one day and said, you know, Jeff, I want you to meet some really cool guys. They're amazing musicians. You probably heard of the Mob Distant Workers. So they're coming to Santa Cruz, and they're playing the Del Mar Theater, and I'm going to set up a meeting for you and your brother. And they came a couple weeks later, and we met them, and it was amazing. It was just like, I immediately got asked to go to work for them. And it was just based on conversing with them. I remember, I think the thing that transformed me, that totally took me away from anything I'd ever known about drums, percussion, music. And I thought I knew a lot until that day. And I watched them do a sound check, and I thought I was on another planet. <laughs> I, I've been transformed and taken somewhere else. And after the sound check, we went down to the dressing room, and I immediately talk, started talking to John McLaughlin and Billy. And it was a beautiful conversation. And they said, you want to go to work for us? And we said, yes. That's so amazing. Did, I moved... I moved three weeks later to New York, and and after a few gigs, they broke up. Oh, wow. Yep. And I began a career with Billy Cobb, and it was amazing. My brother was supposed to work for Billy, too, but John wanted him to work with him. So Joe went to work with the new Mob New, and hence met Jean-Luc Pony where he went off and worked with Jean Luc for a long time. And I I did a lot of work with Billy. It was a, it was so inspiring and so rewarding and and so wonderful because he gave me carte blanche, you know, go to the hardware store, get some tools, do this, do whatever you want, you know. He, there's no mistakes made here. You wanna tune the drums that way, go ahead, try it, give me an idea of what I need to listen to and it was a really, it was a really awesome experience because it was, it was. It, not only did I meet interesting people and amazing musicians and and li- listen to amazing music being created for albums and for tours, but I got to be there with Billy, and every night was a wonderful experience. And uh, and we had a lot of drums. He wasn't afraid to try anything. I got to work with Al Duffy, who invented the chain pedal, and he and I co-invented the, the, the gong drum. And what a great experience that was to have Billy playing these gong drums. And I don't know, he just he was so open. And that, I think that's what's neat about drummers like him. Steve Smith that way. Open. You know, open to hear sounds from other types of drum instruments. And uh, I don't know, it was just... You got to work on five different albums, and uh, I, just, I just can't thank Billy enough. To this day, I, I am so grateful for, for him. He opened the door for me, and he didn't. He never said, no, don't try that, don't do that. Well, that's got to be... That. The only time he ever said something that, that don't, don't do is, don't polish my old Zildjian cymbal. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the only thing he ever said to me, don't do that. All right, okay, I won't. I mean, that's got to be me why I don't do that. It, well, yeah, because I mean, I, you know, I, I never polish a cymbal and, you know, the, the dirt and the grime, I think just makes them sound even better. You know, it, it was his reasoning the same. Yes. It, you, you're, you, if you want to clean out the grooves, don't because the grooves are fine, sound just fine. Right. But we were going through a lot of symbols. We were going to the Zildjian. Lenny DeMuzio back then was letting us go through the room and check out different symbols because, you know, that kind of amplified music, you're, you're playing a lot of different kinds of symbols and, you know, some of them can't take what that music demanded. And we're talking about some major fusion and it was, it was, it was music that people were just, their jaws were dropping. And, and it wasn't just because of Billy, it was because of the, the, comp- the compositions and the way they were being played and the, 
it made you think and listen and it inspired you and it kicked your ass and it just, it just made you want more. It was like extremely addicting for somebody like me. Sure. Well, I've never, I've never I, even had, uh, but, go ahead. But no, I was, I was just, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but didn't I read a quote from you somewhere that, that Billy Cobham played so hard and heavy that he would actually break bass drum spurs off of his kit? No, that's not true. He played, he was very, very, he had amazing technique. And yes, he did play very, uh, you know, he, you, you, we couldn't depend on microphones. Right. Everybody thinks that these guys were playing a certain way. You got to realize this was the, this was the uh, frontier, the new frontier for music. The seventies, man, that's, that's where the stuff started happening. It didn't start happening in the 80s, and it certainly didn't happen in the 90s. It started happening back then, from Miles Davis to you name it. There's, so there's only one spur that got broken, and that was at the place in, in New York that's no longer there. Um, what's that place called? It's owned by New York University, and uh, you used to love to play there. We played there five or six nights in a row. Christmas. What was that place? The Bottom Line in New York. Okay. Famous club. And, man, he, he, he had those double bass drums, those fives. And yeah, on the left bass drum, he broke a spur right off it. And while he was playing, I had to take the front head off because there was no hole in it. And I had to replace the spur while he was playing. <laughs> in fact, sometimes I take my hand drill out there, another one of my little inventions and I'd go out there and change a head while he was playing. Wow. He just leave the stick in it. If I couldn't hear what head broke, he just leave the stick in the hole of a head. Oh man. Oh that head's broken. All right. So, I mean, it was a wonderful experience because he didn't get all uptight about me running out there fixing it. He didn't get he didn't it wasn't a thing where, oh let's get upset now and ruin our show. Hey, the spur broke. What are you gonna do? Right. Well go fix it. We carried a lot of spare parts. <laughs> That's <laughs> and am- amazing. So, and he, he was very, you know, he had a lot of technique with those double bass drums, but yeah, you could definitely hear him. We didn't have any microphones in, 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 inside of him. We had overheads with some close mic. We had a couple like RE twenties out in front or a 57 and there was no hole. It was like tune those things so you can hear them. And, play them so you can hear them. And yeah. It's a really good learning experience how to tune drums because if you're not depending on EQ and some sound engineer, you're not depending on microphones, what, what am I going to do to make this drum project? And like Danny Carey always says, you want to hear the drum and you hear them out front. You don't hear them back here. Well, that's where ve- I'm sitting. That's very you know? true. And, and yeah. so many drummers fall in that trap of tuning their kit so that it sounds good at, at, at to their ears sitting on the drum right. throne you know two feet behind the toms or whatever uh it, yeah. it, they have to be tuned for out front now this may be more folklore i don't know but while you were working with billy that is how you had your encounter with john henry bonham and well let, let, before bonham let's get, let's get to some other things first okay bonham. how about how about lenny white oh yeah mark cranny and drummer david maddox who was with fairport convention at the time i mean we're talking about meeting carmine we're talking about meeting a lot of dr- great drummers because of billy sure. i mean I, I i would i would after a show see in the audience like i remember one night at uh at uh, we played it wasn't even Fishy Hall. Where was that? It was oh Carnegie Hall. On the audience was Buddy Rich and Carl Palmer or something. I know Buddy Rich was there. I think Carl Palmer was there. Carmine. And I mean, the next day in rehearsal at Bill's Music Rentals, Buddy come, opens the door without knocking. He says, "Hey, Billy, nice rehearsal last night at Carnegie." <laughs> and Billy just looked at him and said, "What a little, you know." Yeah. Just, <laughs> you had to laugh, you know. You always always make smart ass remarks like that, but they were funny, you know. But you got to realize a lot of people want to skip 
over all these brilliant players. And, you know, when I remember uh, that's how I met Steve Smith and Vinny Caliuda. They, they were going to Berkeley and they would come, come down to a place that no longer exists in Boston near school there, Berkeley. And they would come down to Paul's Mall. That's where everybody played. And they would watch me working. And they would ask questions. And it was really cool. And I'd say, look at these Berkeley guys. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute. These aren't just Berkeley guys. These are very special drummers. Yeah. And so that's how I began my, began my friendship with Steve Smith and, and Vinny, was by working with Billy. I mean, Billy, Billy, a lot of people came to hear him. A lot of different kinds of drummers. And so you skip ahead a few years, and yeah, we're in, we're in this place in England. It's outside of London, and it's called the Crystal Palace Bowl Party, and it's a it's a venue outdoors where they have this big pond in front of the stage. And all these different bands were playing there, and I remember Liberty Liberty Devito, who I really I loved his playing. He was there with some band, and Carmine came to see him, and there was this band named Cockney Rebel, and they put a elevated, uh, some kind of elevator in the water so he could step off the stage and appear to be walking on water, except it didn't work very well. and <laughs> kind of sunk lower than he was supposed to in the water. He didn't disappear, but he did, he did get wet. So <laughs> that's funky when you're holding onto a microphone. Yeah. Anyway, so so uh, that, then somebody came to me and said, hey, Bottom's in the tent where the catering is and all the time. You should go check him out. And so I go check, I go say hello to him, and he says, Have a beer. And he's holding a keg of beer. Oh my God. He says, Here, drink right out of the keg. He says, Okay, I won't turn that down. So and that's how, that was my first encounter with him. That's, he that, came up on stage. I, I invited him up to see Billy's kit because he, he was asking me about it. I, I hear he has 20-something drums. I said, I don't know if there's 20 up there, but north drums, gong drums, four rack toms, three, four, four toms, three, four toms. And so he came up, and we had a really nice conversation about that. He just thought it was kind of peculiar that that he had me set him up and tune him and, and do all he thought. He thought that, and then he watched him play on the side of the stage, and you could just see his, oh, so this is why they talk about him. Yeah. And the music, you know, you remember there was, there was some funky stuff going on in that music. It wasn't just, you know, the fusing of rock and jazz and all this other stuff. There was, there was a lot of music in, in Billy's music. I mean, that's and, why he's so, you know, just so, uh, um, you know, uh, inspirational to drummers and, and yeah. such a yeah. such an influence on all of us is because he you know he elevated the instrument to a different level yes and tony williams did as well i'd, I'd be remiss not saying that and cindy would kill me if she heard me right now because we got to give a lot of credit to tony williams too but for sure and, and i got to know him later on in life but but i'm just saying that Besides the Ma Vishnu, which I just thought was an amazing band, amazing band. Um, uh, besides that and Billy's music, what it did was it brought a lot of different kinds of people to hear it. It brought Led Zeppelin fans. It brought Queen fans. It brought jazz fans. It brought a lot of different genre uh, of followers of music to to the gigs and i think that's what was fascinating was when we go on tour with the beach boys <laughs> we play gigs in philadelphia at the spectrum with the beach boys and 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 blue oyster call yeah i mean it just it was it was mind-blowing and the, and the, the you gotta remember those albums billy was doing i mean that's how i met tommy boland because he played on that spectrum album and called me in my hotel room and said, please give me a ticket. We're in town. He was, forget who he was with, James Gang, or forget who he was with. And, and it, I don't know. It's just, well, I, those days are different, very different. It was, a, like I say, it was like the front, you know, the new frontier. And we weren't being, well, there, was, there wasn't any rules and there wasn't any, um, 
there wasn't any mores that prohibited us from from learning, experimenting, and uh, observing. I mean, you got to remember something. Back in those days, there were no mentors. We we learned by observing. You want to be a good tile guy? You want to learn how to lay tile? Watch a good tile guy. Right. You want to learn how to be a good mechanic? You better go find a good mechanic to watch. You want to learn how to be a good drummer? Well, you better go watch some good drummers. Well, you've, so, just, you've just been surrounded by them your entire life and entire career. And, and you know, it, I think it goes to show what an influence you've had on the instrument because when Steve Smith and, and you know, Cindy Blackman Santana and Danny Carey and the list goes on and on and on, these super drummers, they all want you to be on the road with them. Well, that's a very flattering thing you're saying, and I'm very blessed because I, 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 you got to remember something. You know, I didn't have to start. I didn't have to go prove myself every time I went and worked for somebody new. What I got to do though was say, "Why don't we try this?" And I didn't get crap given back to me. In other words, I figured this much: if if anything happens from this, it's going to be some respect. And I, and I didn't want to do this and just be another roadie. I wanted to contribute. I wanted to add to something. I wanted to take what was already a brilliant player and help them. Yeah. And, and, and it, may, it makes you feel good if you can help them because their job is already inundated with a lot of stuff. To be brilliant, a, a brilliant artist like that, you got a lot of stuff going on. And the last thing they need to worry about is, oh, geez. What am I supposed to do with this broken thing? Well, you're not even going to have to do anything because I'm already going to have it fixed. So it wasn't just fixing things and modifying things. I, I remember Dave Maddox, I was talking to him once at the Peisty party and at NAM, and he said, you, you forgotten. You, you got tired of the wing nuts breaking off on the, on the, on the um, what do you call it? The things for the hi-hat. I can't remember the name of the part. It's very <laughs> the, important you have it. The clutch. You know, the, yeah, the clutch. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a really good drum tech. What do you call that thing that holds the two symbols, uh, the one symbol uh, on the high hat? Uh, the clutch. Yeah. Anyway, the clutch wing nuts were breaking off all the time. You couldn't take a pair of pliers to them. That'd be stupid. You can't over tighten stuff back then. But stuff wasn't made for the road like it was made, you know, today. And so I just take a huge Allen screw and retap the hole and put an Allen screw in there, and those didn't break. And he reminded me that I did that. I could totally have forgotten that. So we were trying to we were trying to think on our feet. We were trying to come up with answers to these to these issues. And there were no shops, drum shops to go to to get answers. Except maybe the uh, you know uh, the drum shop in in New York and and where Al Duffy worked all the time and invented the chain pedal and you know um that's that there just wasn't a bunch of people out there that you could call up hey what do i do about this you just had to figure it out and see that's the thing is is there weren't guys figuring it out because there they just wanted somebody to set the drums up the drummers were doing all the work the, the guy would get his kit set up and you hopefully set it up right for him you learn the little nuances, learn the little things about what he likes and doesn't like, and you learn how he wants his kit set up because you pay attention. And when you pay attention, it makes him feel good. Wow, thanks for getting this set up so nicely. And let's go a step further with it. Thanks for changing the heads and tuning them and making, helping me make my drums sound good. And that's how it started off. Is you just wanted to be a part of something that was that was at a level that, needed to be sophisticated and you know you get what i'm saying oh absolutely i mean necessity is the mother of invention and you know yes. so many of the things that you did back then when it was you know as you said you know the frontier days so many of the things that you incorporated with your drummers that you were out on the road with it's standard issue today that's very true that's very true. That's, I mean, there's that's, that's a, that's a funny to say. I'm 72 years old, and I'm seeing all these younger guys, and they're 
doing things through. Wonder where they learned that. Not saying, not saying, and you know, I'm not that egotistical. And, and and I am reminded it's okay to be egotistical once in a while. It's also to be very confident. And some people take that as being arrogant. All right, I'll own that. I'll own that. I have a right to. And if Steve Smith was hearing this right now, he would laugh because we had a long talk about what some people perceive to be arrogance really isn't arrogance. It's something they that they're they've kind of earned or earned a right to be very confident and outspoken about. But when I see people doing things, I wonder, well, how did you learn that? I mean, Josh touched in the other day said, you actually took time to, to let me learn how to tune instead of putting me down or, or here, just do it like this. Or, and, and I forgot that. I, he, when he said, okay, you're really close. What did you do there? What did, what did you just do? And, and I, I forgotten that I did that with him and that, see, you know, I learned something from that by, by saying to him, what did you just do that got you to, th- to this point? Because maybe it's something that I would have never thought of. And yeah. uh, isn't that how we all kind of, we feed off each other in a very positive way, not a negative way or not a cheating way. A lot of people steal people's ideas. You know, and I'm not going to name those people that do that, but they, a lot of people copy stuff, and then they, they want to own it. And then I'm thinking, wow, man, you're not, you're not giving credit and respect to the people where you got that. And, and, and I guess a better way of saying that is I think we all can learn from each other, and it's just that back then there wasn't many people doing any of these things. And so you either stepped up to the plate and manned up and, and got it together, or you're just going to be a mediocre person in that music business, and you're never going to go anywhere else, and you're not going to make it a career. And I realized early on that I want this to be a very good I want this to be a career that I can be proud of. Yeah, well, Josh, you know, is is a great friend of mine and he's a great friend to our show. We've had him on the show before and, and you know, he's just a wonderful human being. You know, I wasn't as fortunate. I didn't get to learn drum tuning in person from you. But, you know, now with uh, with the I guess the Internet, you know, it that came after I became a drummer. You know, I, I'm 41 um, but you know, oh, okay. I picked okay. up every video I could find you. I, and I'm talking VHS stuff that you had did over the years, you know, interviews, things like that. So in a weird sort of way, I learned to tune from you as well, Jeff. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. I mean, you know, and I, I w- maybe I should relook at the, all that stuff. Maybe I should. Maybe I need to brush up. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, trust your ears, <laughs> which was a great video that you did and kind of went through Bonham's, you know, green sparkle kit. Um, I, you know, I, I can't, I don't know exactly when that came out, but it's still available. You know, you can find it out on YouTube and Amazon has it on DVD and, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, I think it's still out there. I was going to make another one and that was many years ago. And I, I was very blessed to be asked by Ritter music uh, who, who's done a lot of drum. I was the first drum tech, I think, to do a video like that. And I was very blessed to be asked to do it and get paid to do it and made a little money off it. And I think we, I think we sold 60,000 copies of that. Well, I, I was one of them. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And it was at a damn good place. 1995. Come on. You can't beat that. Yeah, that's exactly right. But I mean, you know, when I started getting serious about this, I thought, you know, I, if I'm going to be recording, I probably ought to know how to tune better than than what I do. You know, I mean, it's it, 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 and there's so much that you can do with tuning of drums. We could do an hour on just tuning from you. We um, could. We could or longer because, you know, it's interesting about what you're saying right now. Is a lot of people didn't look at the studio, especially for drums, as a, a way to maybe tune them differently or do this. What they would do is they were more into muting or taking heads off or let's stuff that in the bass drum or let's do this or let's do that. So if you were fortunate enough, fortunate enough to work with great engineer producers like I did, Ken Scott, who did the White Beatles album, Bowie, 
uh, Vishnu, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of Billy's albums and other things. I mean, if you were fortunate enough to work with guys like that, you could you could find out, you know what? Yeah, the drummer has a lot to do with how great those drums are going to sound with those microphones in the room and the overheads and all that. But especially a good room or the, the drums, decent drums sound good because it's a good room. And not all rooms are good for drums. And that's what's interesting. Back then, Electric Lady Studios, all these studios, there were no, there was not anybody coming in saying, now, nah, you know, that, that drum. And it, it doesn't really happen. The advent of this kind of rhetoric happened later on. Like I did a Stone Sour album with Roy Moroga, and he's a brilliant player. And you know who the Stone Sour is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's Corey Taylor's side project. That, that's Corey Taylor, who's a brilliant singer. Anyway, when I was doing that album, I couldn't, I'm not even going to name the engineers and the, was it Lily White? I can't remember who he, who produced that, but they had me running in the doggone room, tuning the snare drum after one or two beats on it. <laughs> and if, if they ever hear this, I don't care. I said, what is going on here? Why don't you just let them play through? Will you really hear that tension rod coming out of there if he's blasting away and just playing great? Really? Yeah. Or is this overdoing it? And that's what happened. In the old days, they weren't so concentrated on a one little tiny sound. They were waiting to hear what happened with the context of the music. Because it could be a brilliant moment happening that you got on tape. We used tape then. We didn't have Pro Tools. We didn't have all this junk. We had tape. So the tape's running. You're going to stop the tape because you think you hear a tension rod coming loose? I don't think so. No. And I know a lot of drummers that would have said, you're out of your mind. Get out of here. <laughs> because I was just playing my ass off, and you just stop me because you think something's wrong? So it would be, it's a big change from the old days to to how the drums could sound depending on the energy level of the player and the room they're in and how you, what mics you've chosen and how you, what kind of music it is you're playing with. And then let's go to what you just said. Well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to record, I want my drums to sound good. Of course you do, right. but you're not going to know that unless you first get an idea. Well, what, what tune are we working on? Well, we're working on this tune. And you have an idea of what you want your drums to sound like. And that, that's where my job got, kind of got invented back then because Don Perry and drummers like that say, you know what I want? I want this 18-inch floor top to have this sound like this. And how do I get that? And I said, well, let's figure it out. Let's try to get that. And sometimes I would be lucky. I said, well, I work with that guy. I know how to get that sound. And it could be as simple as, tuning all the rods on an 18-inch floor tom, top and bottom, to a certain pitch, and just loosening one of them. Right. I mean, it sounds silly, but what I'm saying is that let's know what it is we want. And, and you, you said something very cool. Well, I, I, if I'm going to go record, shouldn't I want to know how to get my drums to sound the best they can? You don't have a tech there, and you're doing it on your own? Well, that, that's a, that's a brilliant thing. Steve Smith's one of the best tuners there is. Cindy's a good tuner. There's a, there's a lot of guys. Billy's a great tuner. There's a lot of guys that are good tuners. But don't they have enough to do? Let's let the drum guy do it. Yeah, but those guys just set the drums up. Ah, really? Hmm. Well, that's got to change. So that's how this all kind of evolved. Was that you could hear and see. There was, there was some tension going on, and ah, I just can't get this to sound like, well, why don't you let me try, you know? And yeah. so that's, that's what I did. I just kind of took over. I didn't really let wait for the drummer to get there. I just did what I thought was appropriate, and, you know, I was blessed to have a kind of a sense of maybe this would be best for him. And he, he, like I say, you get to know, like if I was in the studio with you for two day, three days, I get to know what you're what you're all about as a player. Well, if I'm paying attention, I should be able to do that on stage too. I should be able to set your drums up on stage 
So when you come up there and sit down, you go, wow, man, they sound great. Not, oh, God, I, what, what, this, why did you do, do that to that drum? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought that's the way you wanted it. In other words, you're paying attention. You're, you're, you're letting your ears and your, your, your focus be in tune with what's going on with the drummer and his drums. Well, and I, I guess I've, I've overstated it. I didn't mean to do that. No, but not at all. Of, you know, we, we kind of jumped, and I, I just want to make sure that in the jumping, it, it, what's interesting about all this is that some drummers learn certain things from other drummers. Some drummers create their own thing. And when you get to work with a drummer that creates his or own, his or her own thing, it's like a, it's like a, a huge blessing and a huge bonus. And I've never worked with drummers that didn't do that. I, I, I was just so blessed. I started off working for brilliant drummers and still do. And I don't ever have a moment where I say, ah, this is so boring. I'm going to quit today and never do this again. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I hear well, wait you. Wait a minute. I, I could take that back. Maybe if I think hard enough, I could say that. But I don't. <laughs> I, I, at age 72, I am tired because of what's going on with me, but I'm still still fascinated by the art, the artistry of drumming. It's this stuff really got me to think about this. The artistry of drumming, the artistry of any craft. What is, what is your artistry? Well, for me, it's the things I do to make my craft really shine. Well, when you're in the studio or when you're on stage, the way you play, you want, you want to be, you want to make a statement. You want to feel good about what you're playing. You want to be the guy that's making the band sound good. Because you take a crappy drummer with a good band, they're not a good band anymore. But you take a good drummer with an average band, and they're a good band. It's so important that the drummer's feeling good, feeling positive, creating, and, and, and really contributing this energy that's needed for the song to, to really make it you know, shine. And so to be a part of that, geez, I, I mean, I, some, I pinch myself because I, I started off with the best, and I'm still there. I didn't digress. I mean, I mean, Lauren Wheaton, who's one of my favorite drum techs, Harry McCarthy, one of my favorite drum techs. They've never stopped working for good drummers. I mean, Lauren worked for Steve Smith. Lauren worked for for years, just recently stopped with, with, uh, you know, Rush, the band Rush. And, you know, come on. I mean, to be able to, keep evolving and being asked to work or, I mean, I, I, I just knew that from the beginning, the, the amount of energy that comes from those players is so invigorating and so motivating and so inspiring to make you want to, to do well and, and come up with answers to questions and, and not have dilemmas, just have some issues that you work out. Absolutely. Well, I mean, now on stage live and in the studio, you know, if you're kind of, if you can't tune live, then you're never going to be able to tune tune in the studio. See, people got, people have a really weird concept about the studio, especially in Nashville and places like that. Oh, wow, man, you got to have this room really dead. Oh, you hear that overtone? What's wrong with the overtone? Is it interfering with the singer? Is the, is the song going to stop now? Is the guitar player? Oh, my God, the guitar player stopped. Oh, the bass player can't even play now. That nerd has got way too much tone. Oh, we can't have that. Yeah. Oh, the bass drum! Oh, the bass drum is ringing. Really? You can hear the bass drum over that loud guitar with those six Marshall amps. Really? <laughs> huh. Tony, I wonder what you're really listening to then. That's so, hilarious. You you know what's interesting about about this? What we're talking about is there's so much up on the other side of this. The engineers back then, and the and the well, I'm not even going to get into the producers. But the engineers back then, they were either so into what was going on or they were so afraid of it. Oh, man, you should take the bottom heads off. You know that big 
mattress that was outside in the alley. Why don't you put that in the bass drum? And, you know, there's some roadkill out there. Put that in there. And, I mean, I just saw, I, I remember one time working with Rare Earth at a festival in Monterey, California. And I love that band, Rare Earth. That singer was a brilliant singer, and he was a drummer. And man, that guy could play and sing. And his snare drum looked like they'd been cooking chop suey on it for weeks. I mean, what Chinese food did you have on there today? And it was dead. And the guy said, you know how to change drum heads? And I thought that was so funny. I'd never been asked that before. <laughs> you know how to change a drum head? I said, yeah. Could you change this one? I said, yeah. Probably need a hammer to get it off, though. <laughs> and you stood over me really tight. You were so tight. Now, don't, you know, I said, hey, man, you need to let me do this. I wasn't even there supposed to be working for them. I was there with that band I told you about, Snail, doing this amazing gig in Monterey at the fairgrounds outside. Bonnie Raitt was there, all these really cool artists. And he stood over me, and I said, man, you got to relax. You're, you're getting me uptight now. I'll do a good job, really. Because back then, it was like, oh, don't change the head. It'll ruin the sound, or I'll never get that sound back. <laughs> it's very out, true. Out People a, didn't change heads. I know. Out, out of a head that's dished out, you know, all 14 inches of it, dished out all over the yeah. head. And they're like, yeah. I, I don't, I want to get that sound back. And, and I'm thinking, God, why? <laughs> yeah. Why didn't you leave that in the trash? I mean, that's a trash sound. And, you know, it's funny. They were so dirty, too. The heads were, they were black and they're, oh, it was disgusting. But, you know, there's other drummers that Elvin Jones, you know, just a lot of great drummers. They had their heads had been left on there a while, but there was a difference in the way they tuned. They pitched things up and the way they played so they could get away with that. And they, they still got great sounds out of it. But there came a time when you had to change them. And they, they were, if, if these engineers were so against it. So you had a lot of, you had a lot of, um, it was a challenge sometimes because you had a lot of uh, word adversity to from engineers. You were just going, whether they be house mix guys outdoors, you know, the out venues or guys in the studio, they just ah, uh, you know that's I don't know if the drummer's going to like that with all you know that there's a there's a tone there and I you know it's a little oh you're saying you're saying the tone's ugly. Well, I'm not saying that, but. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll wait till the, and this is what really offended me in Nashville. Oh, we'll wait till the drummer gets here. I said, no, we won't. We're doing this now. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. I, yeah. I had a real, I had a real rough year there because whether it be Paul Lyme or Eddie Bears or whoever, I had a, I had a rough time. Well, I don't really know. Why are you here again? I'm the, I'm the drum tech. Yeah, but what, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to tune the drum, change the heads and tune the drums. Oh, I don't know. I should wait for the drummer to get here. Well, what do you what do you mean? So, in other words, Harry McCarthy and I, we for a while there, we were wondering, I wonder why they don't understand that we're trying to do a good thing here. Yeah. And then finally, they would say, "Oh, yeah, the drums sound good. I guess I guess you didn't screw them up." Well, yeah. why would I come in here to screw them up? You know? You're paying me to do the opposite. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is very very interesting. But again, there's some old school stuff there with some of those guys, and I don't know. There's there's just not much you can there's not much you can do. Some people were were exposed to certain things in the studio and, and live, and some people weren't. So you could only go by you could you just had to work with those people. I guess, and I guess I guess the thing. Is you gotta have a good sense of humor too, because man, some of that stuff these guys were saying or doing, like that, that guy from Rare Earth, he had a piece of a railroad track inside the bass drum. Oh my god! You know how much weight that is? Yeah. It was like, well, it keeps the bass drum in place. Yeah, it also bows the. Aren't you concerned with that? Well, it works fine. They put the mic on it, and so. You got to see a lot of stuff back then that that kind of blew your mind, you know. 
Well, I, I, I'm I saw sure. one guy, he, he filled up the bass drum with, with, the whole bass drum was filled up. There was no air moving from the room to the resident head. It was just blue. Well, <laughs> he had it filled up. Yeah. And you wonder, well, what, who told him that was a good idea? What well, an engineer did. The engineers got kind of threatened by the 70s and 80s because all these hot shot drummers were playing there saying, hey, I don't, want, I don't want my drums to sound like that. You need, I need to hear more tone in my drum. What do you mean, tone? Well, I, I, I don't, you're not taking my heads off. Leave the bottom heads on because I want them on there. And so, you, so now the engineers are challenged. Oh, boy, this is beyond my, this is a, beyond my scope of my experience. So you got to see a lot of funny stuff back then. A lot of interesting, funny stuff. And it, it is a good way to learn. This is not what I'm going to do, but I am going to go do this. I'm sure for what it's worth, you've seen a little bit of everything. And, you know, one of the things that I want to make sure we get to, Jeff, you know, you you talked a little bit earlier. You said, well, I do get tired now because of what's going on with me. And it it brings me no joy or pleasure. But um, you've had a pretty tough diagnosis here recently. And one of the things that we want to make sure we do here at the Drum Shuffle is talk a little bit about that because you do have a, a, a GoFundMe page going right now to, to help with some of your medical bills. Tell us uh, about your diagnosis and what, and what your doctors are telling us. Let me interject something when you said medical bills. Yes, some medical bills for sure. Uh, I'll tell you what the diagnosis is in a second. But this is so I can live. I can't work right now. Right. I had to leave Santana the second day of rehearsal for the next bout of shows at the House of Blues. You got to go home, dude. Get out. You got to go. You you need to go work on what you've been confronted with. So what happened was the second tour this summer in Europe with Santana, I started losing an immense amount of weight and muscle. I literally was shocked one day when I looked at myself and was lifting something. Man, what is going on? And last year, I had a, well, I've had a tough year all around. Last year, I had this tumor that was, it was saliva gland, and I had a brilliant surgeon get it out for me, and it was benign, everything was fine, went to get the stitches out. You couldn't, it was a pretty heavy-duty surgery, a couple hours to get this. What happened was a saliva gland got clogged up, and it turned into a tumor. But all the tests, pointed out it was benign. But when I went to get the stitches out at the University of Iowa Hospital with this great Dr. Chang, she said, Jeff, I got some bad news for you. It's, it's, it's got microscopic cancer there. You're going to have to have radiation. I said, no, I'm not doing that. Well, if you don't do that, there's a chance it could move from that area, even though it's really tiny, and it could go down to your liver. I said, hmm, that's not a good thing, is it? No, you can die from that. I said, Oh, I guess I'll do the radiation. And luckily, my beautiful friends, Diana and Steve Smith, called me up and said, listen, Jeff, something you need to know about this. This radiation isn't just like an adversary that you've been able to deal with in your life. You've been able to take care of stuff, not have to worry. But this is going to be a little different. This is going to really beat you up. And so I went in at... 209 pounds and left there at 170 after six weeks of radiation. First two weeks were cool. I was running, walking, and I was fine. Then the third week, I could barely get up, and and my mouth had had some surgery done. And my uh, teeth had had some work done on it because the radiation, they make this mask, they hold it down to a table, and then they do this radiation, and it's, six, it's five days a week for six weeks. So when I got done with that, I was pretty beat up and I couldn't work and I couldn't work afterwards. I lost a lot of work and that really bummed me out to not be on my gig with Cindy and, um, and to not feel good and to, to lose all that weight and everything. So I started recovering from that, but I lost all my taste buds. So there came another issue. I couldn't eat very well. I couldn't, I couldn't gain the weight back really with that well. And, and I couldn't taste food, and it became an issue. So 
as I started to get used to that, got a little weight back and got some muscle back and start getting, you know, working out and feeling better. The second tour of the summer with Santana in Europe, I just, something was going on and it scared me. So when I got home, I went to this chiropractor because it was a lower back pain and it was also a leg pain. I just figured it had something to do with my spine. And after six days of seeing him every day, he said, Jeff, I'm very concerned. You need to go get an MRI. And I did. And that pointed out that I had stage four prostate cancer that had moved from my prostate to my stomach area, belly area, and uh, large mass there consistent with the cancer in my prostate. So my daughter flew down from San Francisco and she sat in the office with the oncologist here and uh, we got to hear this news and he had to explain to me what I needed to do. And it's pretty heavy because you can't do anything because that doesn't help the treatments you're getting help you get better. And so I've been very blessed. I got point. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move from Vegas. That's one of the reasons why I need to, I need help. I need to be near my kids. I need to be near people that love me because I, I, I've been living alone for a long time. And if I'm going to heal, I, I don't want to do it in Vegas. <laughs> I need to do it where I love the most, and that's the Bay Area. So. Sure. Well, I... And my kids are so amazing. They're so helpful and loving, and they just they want to see me flourish again and they know I'm tough but they know this is a big this is a major challenge and well I would never ask for help I've always been self-reliant and you know and you know I raised my children I did it mostly on my own and and then, and now they're saying well, this is what we learned from you and you're a tough person but I'm I'm not afraid to say to you on this show it's it's a lot tougher than you think when you drop all this false, you know, oh, I can do this, I can take on anyone. Well, this is, this is serious. And if you're going to really heal, you've got to pay attention to certain things. You've got to eat differently. You've got to watch how much energy you exert. Because you need everything, hope, prayer, and concentration and strength and energy. You need it to heal. And um, so I had to shut down working. And when I shut down working, that means no income. Right. Well, and, and you know, it's it, we've talked about this on this show before. There's no uh, pension plan for people in the music business. There's no nope. there's there's no safety net for any of us, really. And nope. no insurance, nothing. That That's right. There's no safety net for any of us. And, you know, I know that that your doctors have told you, hey, you can beat this, but you're, you're going to have to do everything exactly so. And, yes. you know, kudos to you that you're doing it exactly the way your doctors are telling you. And, um, you know, one of the things that that we want to do here at the Drum Shuffle, um, first of all, you're a great guy, Jeff. And secondly, oh, thank you, man. You're, you're thank welcome. You. That's a very nice thing to say. Very nice thing to say. Well, the, the second part of that is the drum world owes a heavy debt of gratitude to you for the things that you've done and brought to all of us. So um, I'm going to make sure that the wow. show is linked up to your GoFundMe page. Um, and I am going to send the personal plea out to our listeners. Um, you know, it, it's real simple to find it. It's the, the drum and heart beats beat cancer. Go fund me. Uh, you can do a quick search for Jeff Oakletree. Go fund me. You will find it. Um, donate as, as much or, or as little as you can afford because we want to help Jeff get through this and uh, we're all pulling for you. And it, it goes without saying, Jeff, all of our prayers and good vibes uh, are, are going straight out to you. We, we want you to beat this thing. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. I don't, I don't know what to say, except I'm extremely grateful uh, for your words. Thank you very much you're you're welcome and you know here's what i want to do you know normally uh what we do on the show is we ask all of our guests for a good piece of advice 
And I'm not going to put you on the spot for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to (laughs) say, I'm going to say this, as soon as you're back in tip top shape and you got your health back and you've beat this thing, we're going to have you back on the show for a full hour of, of nothing but Jeff Ockletree's advice for drummers, how to tune your drums, how to, (laughs) how to get the most out of your drums we're going to do that as soon as you're feeling a little bit better. Does that sound like a deal, brother? I would love to do that. I would love to do that. And, you know, yes, I would love to do that. I just, it's funny when you were saying, you're saying, okay, what would you, what would you tell somebody? And I, I, all these things came to mind. I said, I wonder if you can say this, or I wonder if you can say that. And it's, it's interesting when you get to be my age and, I've been on the planet quite a while now. My mom is 96, and when I talk to her, it's like talking to a, to the most brilliant. She's got such a sharp mind, and and she she sometimes challenges me about how I express myself. And when you said that just now, it made me think of well, how would I express myself so that it's cool and and worth something because. Why spend, you know, why throw a bunch of words out? And there are a couple things, I think, that don't just apply to my situation or your situation, just in life in general. Is I just don't think we should ever take disrespect from anyone. I agree. We should never look down when people are talking to us as a child. This is, this is what my children learn from me. When you look them in the eye and shake their hand, make them remember it. And don't ever look down when someone's talking to you. Look them in the eye because most people, they can't handle that anyway. So look people in the eye. What have you got to lose? You, it, it trains you. It teaches you. It strengthens you. It helps you with your character. And we all need our character. We need to have, we need to own our own character. It's really important to survive and to feel good. Well, I will say this. Those words are not lost on me, especially in this day and age. And, you know, my show is all about drumming and drums, but there's so much just venom and hate out there in the age of social media and, you know, political divisions and racial stuff and 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 just it's all nonsense we are all human beings fighting the same good fight every day when we get out of bed and that's right put it into perspective you know for just a second if you look somebody in the eye and say hey thank you very much you might be the only person that looks them in the eye that day and says thank you or how are you today or that week that's right or that month that's right. Or their life. Or their life. That's exactly right. And it costs you nothing to do that. Uh, so I, kudos to you, Jeff. Um, again, I want to be respectful of your time. I've kept you too long as it is. But keep us posted on what's going on. Um, we are going to send some donations your way. All of our good vibes, uh, thoughts and prayers are coming your way as well. Let's get you back on the show here in just a couple of months and uh, and hear how everything's going. And you can teach us all how to tune our drums right. <laughs> I can do that on the phone? Well, heck yeah. <laughs> I think you could probably do it from Neptune, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a huge compliment. I don't know if I can live up to that one. But you know what? Uh, thank you for your words. And, and I'm, I feel very blessed to be on your show. And thank you for having me. It means a lot. It really does. Well, it, we, we're going to do it again here real soon. Thank you so much for your time and for everything that you've given to us. Um, it's just, it's amazing. And, you know, I, I've got to hear some good bottom stories next time because I'd I, love to tell you some bottom. I've got a few. I don't have a lot, but I got a couple. I, 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 and and I'm, I'm sure they're doozies too. <laughs> well, you know what? The reason why I think they're doozies is they're coming from me and my experience, not from a magazine or somebody else who, seem to know everything about everything about that guy. I, I just know what I know. I, and, I know. And there's so much you know out there. Yeah. There's so much out there about him. That's just, 
nonsense um you know uh so so we will have you back for some bottom stories some tuning stuff but thank you so much jeff and you get well real soon sir wow wow thank you man that that's a nice way to have my day go now thank you very much you're welcome we will talk to you very very soon jeff okay thanks man thank you All right, everybody. Uh, Once again, want to thank Jeff for taking some time coming on and being so open and honest about some of the challenges that he's facing right now. Uh, If you go out to the drumshuffle.com, one of the links that you're going to see over on the left hand side is a link to Jeff's GoFundMe page. Uh, Let's all get behind that and uh, help this great man out uh, a little bit with some of the stuff that uh, that he's facing. Uh, And I am sincere when I say we're going to have Jeff back as soon as he is able to do so and uh, get some some more good stories from him. So thanks to Jeff for taking the time to come on the show. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Just to give you guys a little bit of an update, uh, of course, we're right in the middle of the holiday season. We've got a few more episodes coming up uh, here to end out the year. I will be taking a couple of uh, Saturdays off uh, during the holidays. So uh, just just keep that on your radar. We're going to be dark for a couple of uh, normal episode days at the end of the year. Uh, just so I can enjoy some time with the family over the holidays. Now, next week, I'm going to be joined by just one of the coolest guys in the business, RJ Rabin. Uh, RJ is just a super nice guy, so you're not going to want to miss that episode. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using to listen in. I certainly would appreciate that. Of course, our web address is thedrumshuffle.com. You can find more information on me over at jamieeds.com. And we love getting your emails. uh, And that address is thedrumshufflepodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from you. So send us an email. We will absolutely respond to that. Thank you all so much for listening. I can't do this without every single one of you doing so every single week. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers. Cheers.